Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to all our speakers and to all our audience today. My name is Marwa and I'll be talking to you about Bima just while we're waiting for people to enter the room. So the British Islamic Medical Association uh, was founded around seven years ago by a small group of doctors. It now comprises of over 3,000 members of various healthcare professionals and all grades. It is the only organization that supports Muslim healthcare professionals from across the board. We also um, cater for pharmacists, dentists, doctors, nurses, physios, students, um, and um, various members of healthcare and professions. BIMA encompasses professionals of many ethnic groups, and of course, we welcome members from all nationalities. Our vision is to inspire, unite and serve, to inspire healthcare professionals, unite them under one umbrella and serve each other and our communities. So as you can see, BIMA runs many fantastic projects. Some of you may have already heard about our flagship, flagship Lifesavers project in which hundreds of volunteers teach basic life support to our communities in mosques around the country. We also hold an annual conference for healthcare professionals as well as regional networking events and socials throughout the year. And we have a PD team, a professional development team, who arrange regular free webinars on various issues affecting Muslim healthcare professionals and patients. Our health promotion team have done a fantastic job over the years with their organ donation campaign, cancer screening awareness, cancer screening awareness initiative, and many more health promotion projects. And we also have a brilliant medical ethics team um, and we publish regular medical journals which are available online at jbima.com. So this is an example of one of our most popular projects where we educated the community on basic life support and basic first aid in over 180 mosques in the UK. Most recently this initiative spread internationally in over nine different countries. We've also won a public health award for our cervical screening awareness campaign. And for Ramadan this year, we worked with over 60 specialists across the board to produce a comprehensive peer review document. And that brought together a range of literature reviews and articles surrounding medical advice and fasting with different medical conditions, as you can see, for example, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, etc. We've had multiple webinars, including the most recent weekly uh, Calming the Hearts of the Helpers webinar. Um, and that was for healthcare professionals on the front line of the COVID crisis, as well as a COVID question time webinar with various specialists. So on the 4th of July yesterday, as you're aware, mosques were allowed to reopen and BIMA were heavily involved in producing guidance on how to safely open mosques post lockdown. So please do join us by visiting our website and please follow us on social media. Just before we begin, um, I'd like to clarify that we do aim to make our webinars as accurate as possible at the time of presentation and things may change thereafter. And that the views expressed by speakers may not re necessarily represent the views of BIMA as an organisation. And I'm sure many of you have attended webinars, especially during lockdown, but just to recap, you will automatically be muted by the presenter um, as you come in. And please note that this webinar is being recorded um, so if you do want to raise your hand, apologies, if you do want to raise your hand, um, just bear that in mind. Um, so anything you say verbally will be recorded. Um, if you want to post questions throughout the webinar, we're accepting questions, so please post in the question box. And if you leave before the end of the webinar, you might need to reconnect to your audio. Um, if the audio stops working, please drop us a message on one of us, we'll try to help. Um, we do have a very large audience today, so we might not get, get time to answer all your questions. If we don't get around to your question and, and it's a pressing question, please feel free to email webinars at britishima.org and we'll have, try our best to, to get back to you. And yeah, as you are aware, this is a free webinar, so please feel free to share the link with others. And please, please, please complete the feedback form at the end of the webinar. We'd, great, we'd greatly appreciate your input. And the link is found below, so www.bit.ly forward slash capital PLM webinar feedback. Thank you very much. So I'll now hand over to Dr. Fatima, who will be your chair for today. 
Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome all. My name is Dr. Fatima Ali and I'll be the chair for this webinar. We are delighted to welcome you to this webinar on this important topic, institutional racism in the NHS. In line with the Black Lives Matter movement and the recent tragic event starting with the death of George Floyd, we in BIMA are united inclusive to serve our communities regardless of ethnic background. This topic has been of great interest to me, especially as I'm from Africa and specifically from Somalia. I have over the years noticed disproportionately low levels of black people in senior roles within the NHS. And I've been alarmed by the level of racism experienced by black people within the healthcare sector. Racism plays no part in Islam. In the history of Islam, some of the well-known companions of our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, were originally from Africa. The companions um, Bilal and Sumeya are an example. May Allah be pleased with them all. In the farewell Hajj, the Prophet وسلم, peace be upon him, addressed his companions and said, all mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor does a non-Arab have any superiority over an Arab. Also, an Arab and also a white has no superiority over a black, nor a black ha have any superiority over a white, except by piety and good action. Learn that every Muslim is a brother to every Muslim and that Muslims constitute one brotherhood. In the UK, there has been multiple reports over the years that black healthcare professionals are discriminated against due to racism at all levels within NHS. In January this year, the NHS government and workforce published the Ethnicity and Facts Figures report. This showed that within the NHS Trust, black staff made up up to 8% of, of junior nurse and midwifery workforce, compared to 1.2% of those in senior managers role or grades. In addition to this, senior doctors, including consultants, were mostly of white or Asian compared to black doctors. Given these alarming figures, we have a duty to abolish racism within the healthcare sector. We hope this webinar will be insightful and inspirational to us all. We hope that you can use this knowledge to, you gain today to take the steps forward to provide better future for black healthcare professionals. I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, Emanuela Darkwa, who will be sharing her experience of racism as a patient. Hello, my name is Emanuela Darqua. Um, I am a health studies graduate and a sickle cell patient. Firstly, I want to thank the organizers for creating this platform and giving me the opportunity to speak. This is important. Um, there have been several times I have faced racism as a patient within the NHS directly and indirectly. One of the ones I can remember vividly was Kent Hospital. I was sent home one time while still in pain and had not had full um, treatment because the hospital claimed they didn't have enough beds. I was due for blood transfusion because my hemoglobin was extremely low, yet I was still sent home on public transport on my own. I was then asked to come back the next day to have my blood transfusion again taken public transport while still in a lot of pain. I had never felt such neglect in my life, to be honest. Um, I tried explaining my condition to the nurse at the time in case she didn't understand the severity of my condition and she had walked away um, before she had claimed that my pain can't be that bad if I'm able to walk so surely um, I must be feeling better because they've given me medication painkillers. Um, I was literally sat in a waiting room hoping that they would have made a mistake and would call me back in. Um, I sat there for over an hour before finding my way home. Um, I have had, I've heard nurses talking about me saying things such as she's clearly exaggerating her pain because she wants attention. Um, a hospital almost overdosed me on morphine because they didn't want to take, um, they didn't want to stop the pump when I had asked them to. I told them I was having severe migraine and I think it's the morphine. One of the nurses responding has said, um, well, that's the only painkiller we can give you right now. So if you don't want to be in pain, then don't complain. Um, a pain nurse had come in the next day and confirmed that the dose that they were giving me was too much and um, it could have easily gone wrong if I had not, if I had taken any more. Um, at times I would be silent and cry, not because of the pain, but because I feel dehumanized from the treatment. And the very people that I want to trust at a vulnerable time can be the same people that have made me feel even worse, um, such as when they would send student paramedics to my house while the professional is waiting in the car. They would yank my hand on the floor telling me um, to calm down because they don't understand that there's a certain procedure to follow, um, attempting to calm me down before even trying to use any needles on my arm. 
Most of the time, avoiding eye contact or talking to me, not being shown the respect that I deserve. For me, the NHS has been life changing and saved my life with medical treatment. Um, I view hospitals, specifically the NHS, as a safe haven and a place where I can feel better when I am facing health difficulties. But also on several occasions, I'd rather suppress my pain and pray it doesn't get any worse, just so that I wouldn't have to experience the neglect. Um, times I've been made to feel as if um, I'm exaggerating my pain or that it is not being heard in comparison to my white counterparts. I know sickle cell is taught and it's also recognised as a public health issue. So it must be negligence that causes these treatments. I honestly do believe that my treatment would, uh, my treatment and, um, and priority would be different if sickle cell was not seen, quote unquote, as a black condition. And if I was not black, the reason for my statement is because I started a chronic health community on Instagram and I see the struggles of different chronic conditions from diverse, diversified groups. My white followers do not have many similar experiences compared to my minority followers, but many of my minority followers have very similar experiences. And um, most of them are the common ones are neglect of their condition or not being taken seriously. If I may suggest some things, um, I would suggest putting in some effort recognizing that you are treating human beings. Put yourself in the shoes of a patient. Um, if it was you, you would want to be given the right care that you need. And so my color or my skin shouldn't automatically make you believe that I am stronger or I can handle more pain than others. I have emotional health just like I have physical health. I am being impacted both ways when I have been ignored or been made to feel like a burden. One positive experience that was quite different and unique that I can use as an example was being spoken to as if I was I still had full control over my decision of the of my body. The nurse in charge asked me diligently questions that allowed me to express myself in a way I would like my treatment and what best works for me. I was spoken to with respect and my concerns were heard by this individual. I honestly can't remember the last time I had such an experience. This felt more like a healthcare institution to me. That's what I define as patient care, and we need more of that. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for sharing your experience with us. I'm sorry that you had such a negative experience in NHS. Our next speaker is Khadija Awusu, who will be speaking about recognising racism. Khadija, could you please share your screen with us? Khadija is an award-winning leader, speaker and fourth-year medical student. She is the Director of Programme at Melanie Medics, President of Medical Elective Equipment Fund, Ambassador at Medic2U to, Medic to and Uber Enterprise. Khadija is an agent for change, a voice for black and ethnic minority aspiring medics, medical students and doctors as she works to tackle issues on diversity, race and differential attainment. She has been a guest of Obama, Michelle Obama at the White House and won the, won the Women in STEM Award at Her Royal Highness Princess Anne. In addition to this, she has spoken at various national and international conferences. She has been selected as the top 150 future leader and has been featured on the BBC, ITV and Channel 5. Before I hand over to Khadija, can I just congratulate you on your achievement as a fourth year medic? Thank you. Um, so my talk today will be on recognising racism. And as the lovely host has mentioned, my name is Khadija Urusu, and I am um, one of the board members, trustees, and the director of programmes at Melanin Medics. So before we go on to um, the talk, I'm just going to introduce Melanin Medics. So Melanie Medics is a registered charitable organization for the present and future African and Caribbean doctor. Our mission is to promote diversity in medicine, widen aspirations, as well as aid career progression through various means. For example, through a number of our events, programs, engagements, outreach, workshops, as well as through mentorship. So the overall um, concept of today's talk will be on racism. Now racism is often a topic that people shy away discussing. It's 
topic makes some people feel quite uncomfortable. And of course, nobody wants to admit, you know, that they might be racist or even acknowledge their own unconscious biases. However, it is now the time where this long standing issue has come to the forefront and it's not an option for you to sit back and not acknowledge what is happening, but it's now required that we do have these conversations. But most importantly, we do take action towards these conversations and ensure that we bring about a change. And I want everyone to understand the magnitude and the impact, the detrimental effects that racism essentially has. And that is that at its worst, racism kills. So for the purpose of this talk, we've decided to split it up into three different aspects. We've got our patients, the workforce, as well as the wider institution. And with regards to our patients, we're having a look at healthcare professionals, racial biases. And as the previous speaker, Emanuela, was highlighting how uh, her pain is often underestim underestimated because of her skin colour when it comes to her sickle cell, as well as the many health inequalities that exist today, which I will go on to speak, speak further on about. And when it comes to the workforce, of course, number one, microaggressions do take place in the workforce. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that has experienced this, and a number of us have. And it's often more, quite difficult because they are subtle, but then again, it's not something to be ignored or missed because they then accumulate. But what makes it difficult is the fact that how do you report such microaggressions in the workplace because they're so subtle in that sense. And then with regards to bullying and harassment, black NHS staff report the highest incidence of bullying and harassment from their colleagues and leaders. And this can be, for example, um, verbal abuse through, for example, not receiving um, honest feedback, exclusion, whether it be socially or even from meetings, as well as perhaps racial abuse from their patients themselves. And then on top of you know, working in such a toxic environment, you have this burden of the fact that you are twice more likely to be referred to the GMC than your white counterparts. And this results in you having an increased chance of being investigated, receiving a warning or a sanction. And on top of all of this, we often forget about the detrimental impacts that it has on one's health. So for example, it can lead to higher levels of stress, anxiety, hypertension, as well as the concept of biological weathering, whereby black people, studies have found that black people are physiologically more older than their white counterparts as a result of the continuous accumulation of these stresses, the bullying, the harassment, the racism, the discrimination, because of all of that, it leads to a greater physiological age. And then if we move on to having a look at our institutions, three aspects tackle that we're tackling today is having a look at the representation in senior leadership. Is the current senior leadership representative of the communities, the various communities that the NHS serves? We're going to have a look at the health inequalities, which are often seen as a peripheral external issue rather than it being a central issue that needs to be tackled immediately, as well as the ethnicity pay gap. So having a look at the representation in our leadership, 92% of the chairs and non-executives of the NHS trusts are white, which surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly to some of you guys, is an increase from 85% in 2018 to 2019. So in that sense, it's actually getting worse. We're becoming less and less representative and it does not reflect the nations, the communities that the NHS serves. And as a result of this, a lack of leadership, you often hear in various other sectors, apart from healthcare, inclusion and diversity in leadership improves the outcomes. So why isn't this being implemented in healthcare, a, a, a sector in which serves so many different communities, a wide diverse communities? And so the question I pose here today is, if we did have such inclusive and diverse leadership boards serving our communities today, would we have seen the such detrimental effects that COVID-19 had on the black and ethnic minority communities? Would we? And then the big topic of health inequalities. So the specific needs of black and ethnic minority patients have been marginalized. There's no doubt about that. And the fact that these health inequalities are further exacerbated by the inaction of these institutions tackling these issues. So some examples are here, and we know from the recent COVID-19 report, black patients are four times more likely to die with COVID-19. Black and ethnic minority patients have poorer mental health outcomes. Black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth, reasons for which have not exactly been pinpointed yet. However, if 
does result in it being a physiological difference, then I'm sorry that is an explanation that we shouldn't accept because not only does it feed into the narrative that um, white bodies are ideal and brown and black bodies are somewhat defective, but it also highlights the fact that if black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth, what are the reasons? If it's due to poor stress or um, livelihood situations, then we, we need to have a look at our structural inequalities in place. And we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing in order to help and provide the adequate care that these women need in order to eradicate such statistics? Black patients are 50% less likely to be prescribed pain medication and medical students perceive black patients to feel less pain. And this was um, a study that I recently read and it honestly um, saddened me because I've now received five years of medical education at a London university and not at one point did we learn or have we studied how having more melanin in your skin translates to you having thicker skin or further translates to you being able to receive or feel or take on more pain than usual so these false beliefs that some people or some healthcare professionals have definitely do shape in which they treat their patients or they provide or assess their patients and as I mentioned before, this will then have a detrimental effect on how these patients are taken care of and as well as potentially losing their lives. And then we have the appalling concept of the ethnicity pay gap. For every one pound a black female doctor earns, a white female doctor earns one pound 19 pence. And a white male doctor will earn one pound 38 pence. So it's one thing to be female. You've take, you've you've asked me to take a step back. And then to be a black female on top of that, it's a double blow. And so knowing that it is quite sad because we all work, work extremely hard to get to where we are, but then to realize we're not being paid the same, it's, it's shocking. And so with that, we need to not ignore the concept of the intersectionality because both being from being a part of both groups um, has a role in which has an impact on how much you're paid and so we need to know that the rise of women all women of all different races should not be at the fall of men nor should the rise of a black woman be at the expense of a white woman in healthcare and we all need to understand the concept of equality but not just equality also equity leveling the playing field ensuring that everyone deserves the same pay for the same hard work that they put in to get to where they are so in summary We've um, discussed the patient aspects, the workforce, as well as the institutional um, level of racism that does occur in our healthcare system today. And um, my colleague Alamade will be speaking on how to tackle these various sectors. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions later on or in the chat. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Khadija, for raising awareness of this discrimination against black people in the NHS. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll bring you a nurse, a nurse's personal story of racism. Unfortunately, our original speaker, who's a nurse in the NHS, was unable to uh, be with us today. Um, finding someone who was willing to share their personal story was challenging, given the sensitivities around opening up. So we're very grateful to have Khadija Saidi volunteer her time to share her experience working as a nurse in Canada, where racism is just as problematic as it is in the UK. Khadija is a retired nurse and the founder and chairman of Women in Dawa, registered Canadian charitable organisation, and she has been running since 2006. She has 27 years volunteering experience and worked as community leader. She has hosted national conferences, workshop leadership training for Muslim brothers and sisters, including presidents of organizations. Khadija has served as a board member for Islamic Society of North America and Canada on national level. She was the British Columbia representative for Islamic Association of Northern Canada, North America and Canada um, for over seven years. More recently, she was the first vice president of the Islamic Society of North America and Canada from 2018 to 2019. Welcome, Khadija. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Um, Black Lives Matter has brought back my experiences. 
after I watched the death of George Floyd. It is my hope that it will help listeners know the depths of harm done to black people's lives who are alive and tortured for racism. The pain is ongoing, no matter how we try to put it behind us. I arrived in the UK as a young woman in, 1990, in, 1990, in 1973. My college life of nursing and through the years of my working as a nurse, I noticed racism from white people. I later found out that this was going to be a part of my life. I decided to work through the agency in various hospitals instead of in one hospital. This reduced my contact with the same type of people and patients. Through this plan, I was able to do my job confidently. Years later, and now having a family of my own, we moved to Canada as landed immigrant. I was employed in one of the multicultural teaching hospital as a nurse 1992. My first job was in a unit that was full, that had various multicultural um, uh, nationalities, but I was the only black then. My welcome to the unit lasted a few days. One of the main nurses who also lived close to me um, saw the way I was being treated and informed me that black nurses have never been able to work in that unit due to racism from a few staff. My tea mugs were removed from the shelves and placed in the garbage bins after my shifts. I was told that the staff room was for the doctors only and for charged nurses, but I saw that the unit coordinators and other healthcare workers in the room were, who were less qualified than me were using the room. During my breaks, I was called back uh, 15 minutes before I was due back, especially on night shift. The patient once complained to me that um, the dress in which I did perfectly well, uh, a nurse told her to report, to, to report me to the charge nurse that I didn't do the dressing properly. And the patient told me that this is a racist attitude. I applied for a job in maternity unit and, and was hired on casual position for 18 months. Back in other units, racism continues from both whites and other minorities. The patients used to tell me, go back to your country often. On one occasion, I introduced myself to a patient as a nurse, and here is what he said. Are you the cleaning lady today? Come back later. I showed my badge that I was wearing, and he said, I do not care. People like you do housekeeping jobs and not as a nurse. Racism talk from the patient was resolved by the unit charge nurse and the doctor whom I called in to speak to the patient. I go home and cry without letting my family see me for many years. Years later, the two nurses I worked with apologized to me for being quiet while I received the bad treatment. A coworker verbally abused me again, and this time I reported the person. The case lasted for nine months. It was settled by human resources. My words to the nurse then was that I'm happy with the 90% of people who treated me as a human being, and I can overlook the 10% who continue to discriminate against me because of my skin and my religion. This is how I retired last year. Muslims can also be racist, but they don't understand that they are racist. It is heartbreaking that I was excluded from field trips by women whom I thought were pious and only to find out about the trips after they have returned. Fortunately, I was able to organize and have some shifts with women through the charitable organization that I founded. It's called Women Idawa. I visited a sister with a photograph of my, one of my daughters many years ago to ask for if his son, her son would consider my daughter for a wife. She told me to leave the photograph behind, which I did. Weeks later, we spoke on the phone and she told me that my daughter is very beautiful, but she and her son would like a, a, a white skinned girl. I was shocked and said nothing. Often online, you read about Muslim looking for would be wife for their son, advertising, light skin of so-so-so origin. 
It is sad that Muslims who don't fully understand that God created us differently so that we may know each other, it means in life, which means in marriage, in work and in everything. My some black low income workers who do housekeeping in, in, Muslim, in Muslim countries and also in China are being treated like slaves as of today. Like many black people, I have been facing the racism of being black or being uh, of wearing hijab in, among the white people and the minority group. From my Muslim brothers and sisters, for I'm facing racism for being black. It is my hope as a Canadian, together with my family, that where the government is making efforts to eliminate the racism for black people. I sincerely hope that as individuals, we should do our part. I will thank the organizer of this uh, occasion, uh, Bima. I will continue the second part of my story after the, the, the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khadija, for sharing this upsetting experiences with us. Um, we're very privileged to have Mr. Abdul Razab with us today, who will share his expert knowledge on the recent Public Health England report on COVID-19 related Black, Asian, minority ethnic deaths and racism. Please, could you share your slides with us? Mr. Abdul Razak has formerly held positions as Director of Public Health for 15 years and has extensive senior executive public health experience in the NHS and local government in the UK. He is currently consultant in public health at Lancashire County Council and visiting senior fellow at the University of Suffolk. He's a member of the UK Faculty of Public Health Special Interest Group on Pakistan and is a fellow of the UK Faculty of Public Health. He has published many articles and he is also the co-author of the recent Center of Evidence-Based Medicine Rapid Review on COVID-19 and Black and Ethnic Minority Deaths. Welcome, Mr. Razak. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you very much, really, uh, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to actually be with you uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I have to say, really, uh, before I go into my presentation, I have been humbled um, um, listening very carefully to the experiences of uh, my previous speakers. Um, some um, some really um, um, issues, clearly very important issues that we have to address uh, as part of the work going forward. Um, my presentation this, uh, this afternoon will concentrate on what I term the four contagions of the coronavirus into the 2020. Uh, the first thing to say is that I do not speak on behalf of Public Health England. I'm not their employee, um, although I clearly have uh, many colleagues who actually work within the organisation. Um, I will relate to the report that the uh, PHE have actually published in terms of their two reports, but I do not speak for the organisation um, um, or, their, or, their, or the actual reports themselves, although uh, we're actually cited as part of one of them. So where we are, colleagues, really, is as follows, really. I believe that in the year of 2020, which is a very challenging year, and it's still not over yet, is that we are dealing with at least four contagions. There are, um, there's an existing and pre-existing uh, contagion of, of inequalities. Inequalities within the UK, which are, are largely um, uh, have been with us for, for uh, many, many years, uh, and clearly the coronavirus uh, issue in terms of the second contagion that we're actually dealing with has, uh, uh, is only uh, amplified and, and, and exacerbated. Uh, the, fourth, uh, the third element, sorry, is, is the contagion of racism uh, following George Floyd and the Black Lives um, um, Matter movement, the contagion of anger as well in terms of our emotional and mental health and well-being. So these four contagions really clearly leave us with a, a, a deep sense of personal and collective anguish um, and clearly our previous e efforts in terms of tackling these four contagions uh, uh, at uh, best clearly have actually been fairly uh, mild and meek. At worst, uh, it's actually been a gross dereliction of our duty of care to all society and an avoidable injustice to ourselves, scarring futures of our common humanity, 
if we fail to address and, and grasp the nettle uh, in terms of the, um, the the challenge that we face uh, for the next 12 uh, to 18 months in terms of coronavirus, clearly we'll be doing not only an injustice to society, but it's an injustice to ourselves, really, uh, as human beings uh, on the planet, really, for a defined period of time. So it's it, and it will clearly continue to scar our common humanity if we don't address these issues uh, in, in terms of uh, developing a new narrative, a new future. So the PhD recommendation, there were seven of them uh, in total uh, in terms of the report, um, in terms of the, the second beyond the data report. And these are actually listed here really in terms of, um, I won't go into them in too much detail because I want to uh, go through the slides and they have approximately 10 minutes. Um, the, the the first one clearly is about ethnicity data and recording. I have to say really that data on ethnicity is far better than it was when I started uh, initially in the NHS in 1993. You know, so uh, going back almost 30 years, it has got a lot better, but there's still aspects of the public sector which clearly do not collect ethnicity data uh, on a systematic basis. We clearly need a co-production model in terms of communities working in terms of research uh, with statutory organisations uh, to better uh, co-produce the solutions. Uh, and clearly we need cultural competence uh, and part of that work is, is in relation to uh, some of the things that, clearly that other speakers would describe, but, but clearly in terms of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, in terms of risk assessments, actually keep protecting uh, all of our staff, including the bank staff. Um, so I'll, go, I'll move on really. In terms of coronavirus as an issue, uh, what we know really is that there are multiple risk factors uh, by, uh, by gender, um, uh, by uh, ethnicity. And what this slide actually does is, is give uh, a relative risk, and, and um, this is from the Alama um, local authority medical um, um, examiners. And basically, we also know really that obesity and body weight plays a factor uh, as to the uh, comorbidities. So uh, I've developed uh, what I call the uh, ICRA contagion framework. Uh, so it's a four level model uh, around inequalities to get to contagion around coronavirus, racism and anger. And clearly you can actually see this within this uh, virtuous or in virtuous, um, as, as we may say, uh, kind of circle. Uh, so because, the, because there are interactions and interdependencies between all of these kind of key aspects, but inequalities is at the heart really of um, some of the uh, some of the issues that we're actually describing. So there are um, multiple uh, aspects of inequalities, social uh, determinants of health in terms of the Michael Marmot report. Uh, there are political um, determinants of health. Uh, there are environmental and, and there are commercial as well. So there are at least what, what I term the spec determinants of, of health. The, the coronavirus pandemic really is, is not, um, it, we're only um, kind of um, in terms of the um, our progress towards um, defeating this uh, pandemic. We're, we're really at uh, phase uh, kind of one really um, and entering into phase two. There are, le there are at least uh, likely to be uh, three or four waves uh, of this and this diagram actually shows really um, what uh, those may actually then look like depending upon how the actual virus behaves and ultimately how humans actually rise to the challenge. So there are six dimensions. Uh, there are direct impacts of the virus in terms of deaths and human suffering. There's the acutely the acute care and health sector and social care sector kind of impact. There's primary community care in terms of people with long-term conditions um, who clearly may have not uh, had access to healthcare provision and their uh, deteriorating health. The lockdown and social distancing in terms of the economic kind of impact. That obviously there's the NHS and social care resilience uh, and clearly economic devastation. So clearly we're beginning to actually see large sectors beginning to uh, lay off people. So all, all of that combined, I don't want to be a doom merchant, but the reality really is that amongst all of this, there will be huge challenges within all of these dimensions of the actual impact around inequalities um, and clearly um, discrimination um, and um, inequality will play a part in each of those uh, six areas. So those impacts really across the pandemic, across the life course, 
uh, are not no different to people of uh, minority ethnic communities, although the, the the issues may actually be amplified. And this is a diagram really just just to go through really uh, what those impacts may actually then be. We completed a review really weeks ahead of the um, PHU review. Uh, we published uh, the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine on the 5th of May, and uh, that's available on their website if you are inclined to have a look. So basically we asked the question, are UK BAME populations at increased vulnerability of COVID-19? And we surmised really that the causes seem to be multiple. There, there's an over-representation of BAME populations in lower, lower socioeconomic groups across the public and private sector, multifamily and multi-generational households are resulting in potential household transmission, disproportionate effects in terms of low uh, band key worker roles such as transport, taxi drivers, which has now been confirmed through ONS data, and comorbidities in terms of cardiovascular diabetes, renal and complex mo multiple morbidities. So what we are dealing with colleagues really is, is structural and individual factors combined. Uh, and those clearly are listed within, within here. The issue really is um, there is no sing single bullet. Uh, this is complex. There's further research around these, these kind of areas. And how do you actually input the causal effects of the various factors uh, using the data that we actually have? In terms of the actual workforce, um, I was a core author of the NHS Risk Assessment Framework with uh, Professor Kamalish Kunti. And this is the framework that you may actually be familiar with. Uh, so this is an independent advisory group uh, reporting into the NHS England with, with trusted chief executives. And clearly from the 24th of June, uh, there is now a deadline nationally for all primary care, all community and uh, acute sectors to have 100% of all staff, uh, ethnicity or otherwise, uh, to, to have a, a full complete risk assessment with their land manager. So, um, and we're doing some further work clearly around that issue. So there's a link to clearly that, uh, that tool. Racism, um, we can't deny that racism actually exists. It's been with us for a long time, um, both within the NHS and within broader society. Um, and clearly um, there's been lots of, um, you know, it's, it's part of history, it's part of humanity. It's, you know, I'm not, I do not make um, any judgments uh, around um, morality, but clearly this is something really clearly that uh, in, in the 21st century, that clearly is something really that we need to actually address together. Um, and because there's, although much progress has actually been made, there's still a lot uh, of distance to actually travel around this particular issue. So, so Michael Marmot really is the, um, the world expert really on social determinants of health. And clearly, um, I'll just uh, quote a few issues uh, from uh, Sir Michael. So, so Sir Michael in 2015 actually said, racism leads to close links between race and socioeconomic position. And then uh, in 2020, he went further in terms of the 10 years on report um, around uh, health inequalities in particular. And he says, my thoughts 10 years ago had been that the reason for people of color had worse health outcomes was because of social determinants of health. In other words, you could explain it all the way through poverty, but my view has changed. Rather than explaining it away, saying that we can explain healthcare inequality through social determinants, we should ask why there are these adverse distributions of the social determinants of health according to people's ethnicity. So clearly the Kunt Fund in 2019, in terms of lived experiences, said really a, a published report, we're here and you're there. Uh, and clearly it, it, it just echoes what our, some of our previous uh, speakers have actually said around their, um, you know, around their experiences. Um, final two slides, if I may. Um, so this is not unique to the UK. Uh, so this really is from Leicester to, uh, to, to Lisbon. Really, clearly Leicester is, is, is clearly about the lockdown of kind of situation and what the co multiple causes of that may actually be. And but we're actually seeing out COVID outbreaks uh, in different communities with high immigrant populations who often live in deprived and crowded conditions. So you can see those uh, outbreaks are actually taking place all across Europe: Leicester, Gushalov, Lisbon, Mondragano, uh, Equinos. So basically, um, these these are the issues really that are face uh, different communities um, across uh, the entire Europe. So there, there are clear recommendations uh, for us, clearly uh, around recruitment and retention in terms of um, some of our previous speakers, in terms of the um, what do we do in terms of seniority. In, I have actually been a senior leader at executive director level working in the NHS as a director of public health. 
uh, yeah, and clearly, uh, yes, uh, there are few and far in number, but clearly there's, um, once you're actually in that position, you have a huge duty of care uh, to wider society uh, and to yourself and to others uh, in, to, in, to be privileged in that position, to actually grow leadership uh, with, within that role. Uh, we need to do more around un unconscious bias training, um, the issue around um, to become um, bored, to become more uh, ethnically diverse, and clearly uh, any death within the health or social care setting should be um, classified as, as a never event in terms of our BAME staff who have actually um, so, um, sadly actually died uh, from, uh, from COVID-19. And clearly there should be a greater level of transparency. And really that is it, is, is it really from me really, and clearly I'm very happy within the panel session to actually take any, any further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Razar, for outlining this significant report so brilliantly. So our next speaker is Dr. Madhupi Abalandi, who is a senior GP, and uh, she has many years' experience working in secondary care and primary care. She's going to tell us about how, she, how it feels to be um, a black doctor and um, at the receiving end of racism. Welcome, Dr. Abalandi. Oh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this talk. I first came into the country in 1992 as a fellow on a fellowship with British Council and Nigerian government. And I'll try and compress or say the important some of the things I considered important in my experience in United Kingdom. I want to compress 28 years of experience into five minutes. When I first came in, being sponsored by British Council, the department was quite welcoming. The first experience I had was with an Asian doctor who I thought was trying to be friendly. And um, unknown to me, all the information it was taking, it was actually using it and saying stories about me. So this led to me having some microaggressions, consistent snide remarks. Your patient will come so many hours to see you. But the main, the main shocking one then was I was in theater one day with a consultant who was operating and being assisted by the senior registrar. There were quite a few of us in theater just observing. During the banter between them, he just called the senior registrar, you this black N-word. And there was complete silence in the theater. Everybody looked at me. I did not respond. Initially, I had problem distinguishing between racism, bullying, and sexism, which is known to occur with female residents in surgical field. This continued, I, but fortunately, I was encouraged by the staff, one of the staff nurses to mention it to the head of department. In that particular hospital, it was unknown. It was not known for us to be thrown, for eggs to be thrown at us, especially walking down the hospital corridor, I mean, what outside the hospital. There were quite a few of us in the hospital at that time, and um, our experiences brought us together. So we shared it, we supported each other, we were constantly on the phone, we anger together. There were about five or six of us. And I remember one of my colleagues was actually in theater being told by a, an Australian anesthetist saying, where I come from, we shoot people like you for game. Eventually, I moved from that hospital and went to another one in South Wales which was quite okay for initially, people were friendly, staff were friendly. Some of the remarks, I took them as ignorance. I was asked one day, you know, there was a, a very obese patient on the table and the consultant said, you wouldn't have this problem in Africa because they won't be this big. I said, actually we do. What do they eat? I said sarcastically, food. 
And of course, everybody around got the message I was trying to pass on to them. So I moved eventually into the surgical training. And that was really, really where I experienced racism in its full blown expression. There were lots of my contract was changed several times, no explanation. I was denied leave several times. Just one reason or the other. My clinic were changed around. My self-directed learning period was changed. The consultant would say, oh, I've dubbed the book myself, so you have to do my clinic. And I was doing a research project at the same time. The lady I was working with got so annoyed once wanted, she wanted to report. As I was trying to differentiate, well, is this racism? Is this sexism? So I constantly spoke, contacted BME, which I was a member. And it got to a point, they advised me that this is more of racism than bullying. And that well, they wanted to step in, but I said, no, I'm gonna make it, don't do anything. And throughout the period, I was demoralized. I felt threatened. In fact, they were threatening me in the lift when just me, when they were just, when I was alone with them. When anybody, anything went wrong, and I was not present. Even sometimes I was not on duty. Then they would say behind my back that it was me who caused it. And one classic example was the patient I saw and I examined and I said, look, you need to have endoscopy urgently. This might be something sinister. The consultant saw him and canceled it and told him to come back in three months that he just scratched his throat with food, with, with the foreign body. I got to know and I told the patient that no, come back if you have any problem. If this doesn't go soon or you have a problem. Eventually it came back, it was the um, terminal stage. It was going, I was going to get the blame for it, if not for the patients saying that no, that black that black doctor actually, if she had treated, she had been allowed to treat me the way she should be, I wouldn't be here. Now, fast forward to when I became a general practitioner. One day we had a doctor, a locum doctor, who came into the practice. He was covering my senior clinical partner. And then he came to my room that, could you examine this black child? Because I do not know how to examine a black child. I was shocked. This was a qualified general practitioner with so many years of medical school and everything. I eventually saw the patient and my senior partner with the practice manager decided that we're not going to bring that doctor back. My senior partner then was of Indian origin. Now I'll go to the last, my latest experience was actually a medical student, one of my medical students who was so upset. And she told me this happened March, 2020, this recent. And she told me that um, during a safeguarding lecture, they were discussing bruising in children. And the consultant, the lecturer actually told them categorically that when the question were asked that it is not, you are not negligent if you miss bruising in a black child. They were so upset, there were three of them of African origin in the, and they were really, really upset. So this is how I got to know about it. And I'm pleased to know that uh, with my encouragement, they have made, they've informed Dean and this is ongoing. How did I deal with racism? It depends, you deal with it, sarcasm, jokes, but it's quite stressful, destructive. And at one point, I actually, on the encouragement of my GP, needed to have counseling, which I found very, very helpful. Not all everybody is, but when they are, it can, the cost of racism to the doctor, to the patient, like my patient who died after the coming generation is quite immense. And I'm quite happy to do whatever I can do to help the oncoming generation to be able to deal with it. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Oblade, for sharing this with us. I'm very sorry you had to experience this. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Shazad Amin, who will present, who will represent, will present um, key points from the Fair to Refer report by the GMC. Dr. Shazad has been a Chief Executive of MEND, Muslim Engagement and Development, since 2016. MEND is a grassroots organisation tackling Islamophobia in the UK and promoting greater civic media and political engagement of British Muslims. He retired in 2017 as a, as a consultant psychiatrist in NHS based in Manchester. He works as a court expert witness mainly in the area of clinical negligence and he's also a chair of the Medical Practitioners Tribunal Service which makes decisions about doctors fitness to practice. He's also a former Care Quality Commission Specialist Advisor. Welcome, Dr. Amin. Jazakallah khairan, bismillah rahman rahim assalamu alaikum to uh, all the listeners and viewers. Um, and thank you to Bima for inviting me to talk about this um, important uh, topic. Very moving, listening to the uh, previous speaker. Uh, and following on from that, I've been asked to comment on the GMC Fair to Refer report. But uh, before I do that, a bit of context, first of all, because um, it's been well known, uh, certainly um, in the BMA community, um, the BMA community, uh, that there is a disproportionate, there has been a disproportionate number of referrals. Uh, and people have always felt that there was some degree of structural racism in this. And the evidence shows that um, uh, in the past, if you are a BAME doctor, you are twice as likely to be referred to the GMC. And if you're a doctor who's trained overseas, you are 2.5 times more likely to be referred. So there's some evidence um, for this. Before we come on to the report, I just want to touch on a very important case which, which leads on nicely to this report. And some of you will have heard of this report, the case of Dr. Haditha Bawa Garba, um, which uh, was um, in the news, has been in the news in the past uh, few years. I I'll just briefly mention this. We might touch on it a bit more in the, um, in the panel discussion, but uh, it's important, I think, to set the context for this, uh, this talk. So she was an SPR in pediatrics, so in 2011, came back from a period of maternity leave um, and was looking after a lot of sick children and was uh, to basically asked to see a, a child called Jack Adcock, a six, six year old boy who had sepsis. Um, and to cut a long story short, there were some mistakes that she made in his care, which unfortunately led to him dying. Um, and there was a criminal investigation following which she was found guilty of gross negligence manslaughter and given a two year suspended jail sentence. Now she was referred to, by the GMC to the professional regulator, that's the MPTS, Medical Practitioner Tribunal Service, who heard her case and took into account all the other factors that were involved in this tragedy. So for example, she came back from maternity leave, there was no induction, there was no senior consultant cover, there were kind of um, all, all sorts of other issues that were involved in this kind of tragic series of errors. And it took those into account and it didn't strike her off, but instead it suspended her for 12 months. Now, the GMC was calling for her erasure uh, and said that uh, erasure was the only um, correct um, sanction to uphold public confidence in the medical profession. So the GMC, as it's right, is it, it appealed to the High Court. The High Court overturned the MPTS decision uh, and substituted erasure. Um, and then there was a subsequent Court of Appeal which overturned the High Court. And then a further NPTS hearing last year, uh, which allowed it to come back to work with conditions. So that's a brief timeline. As you may be aware, there was absolute uproar after the GMC referred this case back to the High Court, uh, because a lot of doctors felt it was very, very unfair uh, that she was being struck off for a genuine mistake in a very difficult situation. Uh, and a lot of doctors saying, well, you know what, you know, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I basically, because I've been in a similar situation. So a lot of doctors felt that it was the wrong thing to do to criminalize and strike off a doctor for a mistake in those circumstances. But anyway, um, it led to a, a further review called the Williams Review. And now the GMC doesn't have the uh, power, or will not have the power to refer MPTS cases to the uh, um, High Court. Anyway, that leads us to the GMC Fair to Refer report. Now, this didn't come back directly as a result, but certainly part of the discussion around this time, the GMC was under a lot of pressure following the Bawa Garba case. Um, there were several calls for a no confidence vote in the GMC leadership, et cetera. And this report was in that context. And it found really um, uh, uh, factors related to the individual 
and factors related to the environment, the institutional factors. And I'll briefly mention those. So it found five main factors which led to um, people being referred uh, to the GMC or more likely to be referred. The first is not surprising, the first two rather go together. The first is obviously being an international medical graduate, um, i.e. Uh, being trained or primary medical qualification being overseas and being an international doctor. Um, and I think along with that, I would say that language is a key factor in all of that as well. Um, because obviously, you know, people learn English all over the world um, and they're training, you know, in their own countries, as it were. But actually, language is just as much more than simply being able to understand the words. You know, when you practice medicine, you have to understand the culture of the community you are treating patients in. And there are subtleties of idioms and nuances that it's very difficult for a doctor coming into the NHS, you know, from overseas to pick up straight away. And as a simple example, if you made a statement uh, and I said, uh, right, uh, in that way, I'm indicating that I'm agreeing with you. But if you made the same statement, I say, right, yeah, I'm using the same word, but I'm actually completely disagreeing with you, yeah? So it's much more than just words uh, and what they mean. So um, that was a, a, a big factor. Uh, another factor was age. Uh, older doctors were tending to be referred more likely to be referred, and that's something to do with maybe uh, losing some clinical skills or actually narrowing their focus of interest, not keeping up CPD, things like that. The fourth factor is more relevant to uh, ethnic minority doctors, and that was um, you're more likely to be referred if you were a locum doctor or a staff grade uh, or associate specialist. Uh, so these are non-training grade doctors, and I I I've been a a former director of medical education before as well and like you can say certainly that often these doctors are using the nhs as general workhorses yeah they're not given the same uh, accord the same status uh, and often not given the same access to training cpd personal development all of these things it were um so they're kind of a separate group uh, and not seen the same light as training doctors or consultants certainly in a hospital setting and the final factor was a more general one, which encompasses all the others, I think, and that was basically doctors didn't fit in. So we all know that doctors, whether in hospital or GP surgeries, we're all part of a community. And actually, there are certain cliques that can develop, as it were. And often doctors, sometimes from overseas and BMA doctors, for whatever reason, don't fit in, are somewhat kind of ostracized. And it's been found that that's more likely as well to lead you to be referred to the GMC. Uh, in terms of um, what institutional factors were, they found, well, unconscious bias has already been mentioned, I think, was a very important factor. Um, uh, and obviously, that's something that's gained a lot of interest in recent um, in recent years with uh, the whole issue of racism in the NHS. Um, uh, the second factor was culture and safety. Now, uh, I think it's not controversial to say um, that um, the NHS it is a difficult environment. There's often a culture of blame uh, in terms of race, in addition to racism, bullying, as it were. So when things go wrong, um, when there's an investigation, sometimes people uh, look for people to blame. And there's a very famous case of uh, David Salou, a surgeon um, who was struck off in 2011 and also in prison for 18, two, 18 months um, um, at that time, which was overturned on appeal um, for failure to look after a patient who died in his care. And it was found actually in the appeal that actually he was basically made a scapegoat um, for a lot of failings and failings on behalf of the trust as well at that time. So um, culture and safety and, and uh, looking into this a bit more, I can recommend an excellent book. If I can put it to the camera, you can really see it. Uh, it's called Black Box Thinking by Matthew Sayed. Um, and it's an excellent book looking at how different um, uh, industries uh, look at the issue of mistakes. So Matthew said contrasts how the NHS looks at mistakes and its blame culture versus the aviation industry and how it looks at mistakes and supports people and, and, uh, and learning from them rather than blaming people uh, and ostracizing them. Very, very useful book to read. And um, the third issue was quality of leadership. Look, we know people and senior managers are often taking the lead in investigating when things go wrong. And the good managers, actually, when there isn't a massive issue about patient safety, they have the skills in able to actually create a supportive environment in which the doctor can be supported and everyone can learn from the mistake rather than simply kind of criticizing and blaming and referring that single doctor when there may be other environmental factors leading to that um, mistake. Uh, and finally, um, there is something called the, the threshold for referral. So it's been shown that 
essentially when there are problems, whether it's in primary or secondary care, um, that the threshold that people have for referring BME doctors is generally less. Uh, and that obviously speaks to unconscious bias and all sorts of relationship issues as well. Um, but that's something also uh, we need to be aware of, that actually people are more likely to be referred at an earlier stage. Uh, and that's been shown by evidence as well, actually, that things are escalated more quickly to the GMC, whereas for other doctors, a lot of things are happening a little bit more, more local, really. Um, and in terms of their recommendations, um, they said, well, there has to be a lot of support for new doctors coming to the NHS in the UK. And certainly as, as former director of medical education, I think we always had this as an issue, people coming for the first time. It, it seems ridiculous. I mean, no other employer would allow someone to start working wherever they were, you know, in the UK without any kind of induction uh, or, or introduction to the kind of workplace environment, etc. Um, so that's a big, big recommendation. The second recommendation was actually that people need basically to improve their leadership. Uh, and the culture needs to improve to be able to support doctors uh, locally before escalating it to the GMC. Uh, and more importantly, looking at the working environment, we have to develop a culture of learning and accountability uh, rather than blame. And that's not to say there aren't serious mistakes made and mistakes made by all sorts of doctors. And obviously some mistakes are very serious and have to be referred to the GMC. But a lot of mistakes, and certainly when I'm sitting in the MPTS panel, I see cases uh, before me where you think, well, hold on, why couldn't this have been um, sorted out locally, really? It isn't that, that serious an issue. Um, so cases do get escalated. So I think if we can improve that culture, um, then I think we can see a reduction in some of the cases that don't need to go to the GMC being referred. Um, so that's, um, and that's something, though, which will take um, really quite a long time to actually um, take hold, because obviously we're looking at a system-wide problem here um uh, in terms of you know and it links into bullying and racism and all the rest of it kind of thing as well so i think that's not an easy thing to turn around overnight um but i think a lot more research needs to go into um uh, issues I'm sorry, like I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt we're, we're running out of time would you mind um 30 seconds conclusion if that's okay yeah yeah so basically my conclusion is that uh, it's worth reading the report there are a lot of factors um that are involved in being referred to the gmc and my suggestion would be to Beamer, I think the whole seminar needs to be devoted to what doctors can do to lessen the likelihood of being referred to the GMC, because there are lots of things practically you can do. And if you are in trouble, I think there, there are lots of things that you can actually mitigate, do to mitigate against that. But thank you very much. My time's up. And I'm happy to take any questions in the panel session at the end. Thank you, Dr. Amin. I'm sure we'll have many questions about the report. Thank you so much. Our final speaker is Onobande Dada, who will be giving us a practical tips on tackling racism in the NHS. Please share your slides with us. She's a medical student and the founder of Melanin Medics, a charity that supports African and Caribbean medical students and doctors. Onobande is an advocate for racial equality in medicine and has actively led the charity in promoting diversity in medicine widening aspiration aid in career progression. She's also passionate about widening participation and empowering young people. Olamade has been the recipient of multiple awards, including the Rising Star in Healthcare in 2018 and 2020. Sorry, 2018 and 2020 awards. She has, rec she has been recognized as one of the top 10 black students in the UK. She was also recognized as one of the top Hundred future leaders in 2000, 2018, and as a result, she was welcomed to number 10 Downing Street. Olomade was named as the recipient of a, of a Karundi Medical Scholarship Award to minority ethnic medical students with strong leadership potential. Congratulations to your awards and your achievements, and the founder of Melanie Medics. Welcome. Thank you very much um, for introducing me. Please bear with me as so I just display my slides very quickly. Awesome. So, um, yes, my name is Olana Day Dada. I am a medical student and I'm also the founder of Melanie Medics, as mentioned before. I will be speaking today about tackling racism. What can we do now? What steps do we need to prioritise and what tangible steps can we take? But the first thing that I did want to establish is that it isn't the responsibility of the affected to combat racism. If racism is something that we really do not want to exist in our society, in the NHS, we have to all take responsibility for tackling racism head on where we can identify it. So what needs to be done? You're probably wondering, why do I have a cross over this image? 
Well, the reason is because I don't think this image is, is suitable when describing or um, tackling racial inequality. Um, and I say this because I think that the image doesn't, sorry, bear with me. I think the image it, it, uh, implies that there's like innate differences within the individuals. However, in this occasion or in this case, you know, I think it's very important to recognize that actually there is something that we can do about racial injustice. There is something that we can do about racial inequality. And so I think this picture is more befitting um, and it just shows the, the process of inequality, equality, why um, evenly distributing tools and assistance doesn't quite help, as well as equity. Um, so that's custom tools to address the issues and to address inequalities. But in reality, we actually have to make sure that the root cause um, is being fixed and that is a system, making sure that we offer equal access to um, both tools and opportunities and i think we need to simultaneously address the root causes of institutional racism not just their manifestation and this means getting rid of policies practices attitudes and cultural messages that reinforce differential outcomes by race or fail to eliminate them so if we're honest individual racial bias is a big problem a very big problem as individuals we're very likely to be biased and our bias is based on our experiences and what we've interacted with on a day-to-day -day basis however it's something that we need to become a lot more mindful of so whether you call it individual racial bias or prejudice or racist beliefs whatever you want to call it this is something that we need to actually challenge we can't not we can't just be passive about it but we actually need to take steps to educating ourselves we actually need to take steps to um, recognizing within ourselves where our bias may manifest itself more than others and i really love the quote that says you're personally responsible for becoming more ethical than the society you grew up in for many people you know the societies we've grown up in have put reinforced these racial biases or these racist beliefs you know you know and we have to separate ourselves from that we have to actually choose to become more informed so that we can challenge racism Okay, so how can we actually challenge individual racial bias in the NHS? And a lot of the issues that, that Khadija so excellently highlighted earlier on uh, is that, so with bullying and harassment, individual racial bias is at play. Um, you know, with patient interactions, individual racial bias is at play. With the disproportionate um, disciplinary action towards BME doctors, individual racial bias is also at play. And I think we need to actually recognize that there is something that can be done about this the first thing is policy we often think that zero tolerance to racism in the nhs exists but it actually doesn't um and i think zero tolerance really needs to mean zero to zero tolerance across the board um an example i can use is that for example if a patient makes a request and says they don't want to be treated by the black doctor um the reaction of their colleagues in that moment is very very important in reinforcing what the nhs believes or what the nhs stands for if the the um doctors or the healthcare professionals around um allow the patient to make that preference and to make that choice um even though it's based on racist racist ideas um they're reinforcing the fact that this behavior is actually allowed however if they stand in solidarity with that doctor and say you know what i'm that doctor is equally as competent as i am so if you don't want that doctor i'm not sure why you'd want me um and just actually challenging that behavior of course i i recognize that there are situations and circumstances where um this might not be possible particularly in emergency situations i recognize that but i think it's really important to actually challenge and appropriate behavior and to show people that zero tolerance to racism really means zero tolerance in all of its forms and the next thing that i was going to go on to is actually recognizing this inappropriate behavior and challenging inappropriate behavior um and i i say this also because um oftentimes you'll hear jokes that that people say um and they have racial undertones but if you actually took a second to say i'm sorry what's funny here or please explain the joke, I don't really get it. You'll be surprised that people actually recognize that what they're saying is inappropriate. And that's why I questioned how unconscious, unconscious bias really is. You know, these are things that we, we have an awareness of, somewhat of an awareness of, and this is why we actually actively have to go against these things. I think we can't dismiss seemingly harmless behaviors, particularly microaggressions. We, if it's possible, we actually, it's best to address them in the moment because these subtle incidences can actually become quite cumulative. The impact on individuals, um, it starts to wear away at them. And it's gotten to the stage where microaggressions have become so normal to me, and I'm still quite early on in my training. And I, I'm hopeful that one day it will improve and you know, these are things that we won't encounter. 
um, anymore. Oh, I'm not sure why that happened. Um, yes, yeah, so these are things we won't encounter anymore. Um, but we have to be mindful of the way we're actually treating people and challenging behavior when we come across it. In-depth training. So there's a number of different names for training currently offered, um, whether it's EGI training, unconscious bias training, anti-racism training, or active bystander training. Um, but I think the main thing to recognize is that training is not going to, it, training in itself does not produce long-term change. Training is only a catalyst, it's only an entry point to producing this change, but actually the sus sustenance of the change um, initiated during training is on the individual, the responsibility is placed on the individuals. And this is why we have to educate ourselves. This is why we actually constantly have to engage in training. We can never feel like we know enough because in reality, we're going to continue to uh, encounter people from various different backgrounds and various walks of life. And this is also why diversity of training methods delivered and diversity of trainers are very, very important. And I think it's very key to move beyond stereotypes, I think a lot of the knowledge of ethnic minority groups and black groups are very, very stereotypical ideas. Um, and I think we need to start to explore more complex situations where individuals are more likely to be on the fence. Um, you know, situations where people often question where it's whether it's really racism at play. And I, I really love, I love a lot of quotes, um, but I, I do think the quote that says, what you allow is what will continue. And I think that is what has happened thus far. You know, there's certain behaviors that we have allowed, there's certain behaviors that we've given the benefit of the doubt. But I saw a quote in one of the earlier um, talks given and it said, racism, it stops with me. And I think that's why it's important to challenge these things when we encounter them or when we recognize them, that's how we can play our part. Okay. And the next thing I was going to say is that it's very important to empower patients and colleagues to speak up. Um, the only way that we can keep track of any change and progress is data. Um, and if people aren't reporting these incidences, you know, how accurate or how representative is the data that's been published? Um, how representative is it of the true problem at hand? And I think this is why trusted allies are very important. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to get to the stage where, you know, we don't require speak up guardians or particular individuals um, that, you know, all these incidences are diverted to, but actually people who aren't, who, who, even, who haven't been affected by um, the incidences are even able to say, you know, this is how the process works. This is how I can support you with the process. Okay, what would you like to do? How would you like for me to support you? Is there anything that I could have done better in that situation? And really questioning their role um, and playing that part in challenging racial bias wherever it rears its head. I think there's a need for appropriate welfare support and culturally competent services. Um, racism, the best word I can use to describe racism is that it's quite stifling. It's stifling in many areas and we can't ignore the impacts emotionally, physically, whatever it may be. Um, but this is why we need designated welfare support for these, in for these individuals as well, as well as transparency of complaints process and protection for whistleblowers. I'm so sorry, I have run it out of time. So um, I think the core problem, and I mentioned it um, earlier on in my slides, but what, what is the core problem? And I think when these systems were established, when the NHS was established, it's likely that the individuals around the table were from similar walks of life. And we can't expect the, um, you know, these individuals to actually relate with the experiences of ethnic minorities if that wasn't close to them or if that wasn't something that they had been privy to before but i think as times change and as seasons change and the uk has become a lot more diverse we need representation in senior leadership that is at the core of institutional racism and that is a way to stop institutional racism being further propagated in the nhs and one thing that people in these positions now can do is reallocate the power to people who have been historically marginalized okay Ooh, I just skipped a slide. And this can be done by amplifying the voices of the underrepresented. And a perfect way to do this is making room for and recognizing as legitimate the approaches and the feelings and worldviews of people who have been affected by racism. Here are some examples of what can be done open forums to help inform change, reverse mentoring, as well as avoiding optical displays of allyship and meaningless gestures. And I'm not going to speak too much on health inequalities because I think it's been touched on. Um, quite well in the past, but I think it's very important to move away from the savior complex and uh, rather act in solidarity with these groups, act in solidarity with the individuals, individuals who have been affected, seek to understand the differences and understand these groups and the unique challenges faced between them. I know black people don't always have the same challenges 
there's other ethnic minority groups and I think we need to recognize this in the diversity of interventions that we're putting into place um, and in action only makes things worse. And this is my final quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much Alamade for the very valuable tips in tackling racism. Um, I will now hand over to Dr Shinaz for the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Fatima. We've had so many questions in the chat box and we've tried to answer them as we go along. I know that um, some people have repeatedly asked questions, so I might unmute you. We might not be able to get through all the questions, but um, we'll try and get as many as we can uh, for the next few minutes. So I'm going to um, unmute um, you now. Um, is it Dr. Jir? The other mute. Tabassum the man, they. There you go. Tabassum. Can you hear me? If you unmute yourself on your side, if you'd like to. Tabassum the man, are you there? Hello? Tabassum the man, can you hear me? No, we're having some problems there. That's right. We're having a few problems there. So I'll just go with some of the questions that we've already been asked. Um, one for uh, Dr. Shazad. How does how does um, ethnicity? being international graduate SAS doctor affect the outcome of GMC investigation? Dr. Shazad? If you all unmute yourselves. Thank you. I'm sorry, it wasn't uh, responding to my, uh, my uh, muting. Um, yeah, um, thank you for the question. Oh, um, uh, first of all, I don't speak for the GMC, I don't work for the GMC, um, I'm on the NPTS, but uh, look, directly, it, it doesn't affect it. And in fact, that would be illegal, actually, if uh, being an international medical doctor uh, directly affected a GMC investigation, but it might affect it in indirect ways, like I've suggested before. So language, for example, could be a factor. Where you've trained in your experience could be a factor. Uh, so for example, when I was a foundation program director, uh, we basically screened all of our new starters um, and uh, uh, we, we basically did sort of simple medical scenarios with them. And I remember uh, a young a female doctor from uh, from Sudan uh, and she hadn't worked or even been in the UK before. Um, and she was quite poor, some of her clinical skills. And I did some basic medical scenarios with her. Uh, and I said to her, um, for example, um, what would you do if you're working in casualty? and a man came to casualty and was vomiting blood and was drinking 10 pints of lager a day. What would you think in terms of the, the differential diagnosis? And she said to look at me and said, uh, lager, what's that? And it dawned on me, of course, in Sudan, she'd never heard of lager before. And there was no basically a problem like in terms of alcoholism that kind of in that way, as it were. So, you know, there can be blind spots that we all have that if we, if we all went to different countries, we wouldn't necessarily understand all of the key uh, terms, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it's, so should, the short answer is no, it doesn't have directly affect it, but there may be issues indirectly affected with having trained overseas. And we know, obviously, there's a high proportion. Uh, of doctors from overseas do get referred. Um, and that's not just from classic BMA communities, Africa, Asia, that's from Eastern Europe as well, uh, and other countries which, uh, which um, ha have a lot of doctors coming over here to work. Oh, thank you. Uh, Doctor, um, sorry, Said yes, Ahmed, okay. um, can this you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, would you like to oh, ask yeah. a question? Yeah, this is mainly Shazad's going to get a lot of questions today. Looks like it. So, very, I'm a consultant, senior consultant. Why is in the NHS somebody guilty until proven innocent, whilst in justice is the other way around? You are innocent until proven guilty. And what I mean by that is, as soon as there is any chance of you of doing something wrong or being investigated, you are sent home for that investigation then to complete. So, in effect, being complicit in your guilt.
Okay. Did so you get that? Is, Thank you. Ayah from Allah. So the cure of magic is verses from Allah. Did you get that question, Shazad? So yeah, sorry, I was some somebody else was talking at the same time. Sorry. Um, yeah, I got the question. Thank you. Um, uh, the first thing. No. So you say these are the words the person has taught us. You say. Sorry, is somebody else speaking? Okay. Shall I answer the question now? Yes, please do answer the question. Sorry, yeah, I was getting some of feedback there. Huh? Yes, thank you for the question. Look, um, the first thing is, again, I don't speak for GMC, but in terms of, you know, Puma being suspended, technically speaking, being suspended is a neutral act. Yeah. Now, obviously, you can infer guilt if you want someone being suspended, but that's quite normal in all organizations, not just the NHS. When there's a senior severe, serious investigation taking place, people are often suspended or certainly the two people in dispute or whatever are removed. Yeah. In terms of the, the doctor being guilty until found innocent, it's not actually that's that's not actually the case. I mean, again, speaking from the MPTS perspective, look, when the GMC brings its case, so basically investigates the doctor. Um, if it finds there's wrongdoing, it basically forms allegations against them and it brings the case to the MPTS. Now, the MPTS hears the case both from the uh, GMC and the doctor. The onus is on the GMC to prove its case. Yeah. The doctor doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to even give evidence. In fact, I've had several cases where the doctor hasn't given evidence and the GMC hasn't proven its case and we've not found the case proven. So actually, it's not strictly correct to say uh, it's it's reversing the usual presumption of innocence. It's actually the same um, uh, in term. Obviously, the, the standard of proof is different and balance of probability, uh, not the criminal proof beyond reasonable doubt. Um, but generally speaking, um, it, it's, it is the same. Now, of course, your question presupposes, of course, there may be many uh, doctors uh, investigated by the GMC who feel they haven't had a fair hearing and actually been unfairly dealt with. I'm not disputing that for a minute, uh, but the burden of proof is actually um, no different. Thank you for that answer. Um, I'm going to have to move swiftly on because we're coming to the end of the webinar, but I'd like to introduce Amara Alahi. Um, Amara, are you there? Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Amara um, is a journalist from the BBC and um, she'll explain what she's been doing because she's very interested in BMA, BMA doctors uh, during the coronavirus pandemic and their experiences. Amara, we've just got a few minutes if you'd like to explain what your research was about and also what your current research is. Thank you. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to attend this webinar. It's been really eye-opening to hear today about the experiences of racism in the NHS and really saddening actually that in the 21st century we're still trying to tackle these prejudices and inequalities especially in medicine which is not meant to discriminate. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm a health reporter for the BBC's national TV and radio news programmes, a role that I've undertaken for the past three years now and I've got a deep interest in the experiences of ethnic minority doctors. So I covered the cases of Hadiza Bawagaba and David Selyu. And last year I worked on an investigative report about racial bias in GMC referrals. So I know you've already spoken about this, um, but, I, but I actually analyzed the GMC referrals for doctors of different ethnic groups over a five year period and found that 44% um, of complaints made against black doctors led to investigations. For Asian doctors, it was 40%, and for white doctors, it was just 29%. Furthermore, 12% of black doctors were suspended or erased from the medical register after an investigation by the MPTS, which was more than double than um, double the proportion of white doctors. So really quite stark figures there, you know. Um, and the GFC at the time said that they weren't complacent about their own processes being free from discrimination and that they regularly and independently get them reviewed. However, it seems that a year on from my report, nothing has changed. So you just have to look at the names listed on the MPTS hearings uh, website, and they are still, the majority of them are non-white. Um, obviously, you know, this is something that the BMA recognised is an issue too, but it just seems progress is really painfully slow. And perhaps, you know, it's got something to do with the fact that, as you mentioned earlier, the majority of chairs and non-executive members in trust are white. 
Um, and I just think an organisation cannot appreciate the extent of racial discrimination if the people leading it aren't ethnically diverse. Um, so I think um, I, I mentioned that I also covered the fair to refer review, which you've also um, touched upon in the webinar. Um, and it was disappointing that that didn't go further in its recommendations to the GMC. Um, I mean, I think that you know, in order to to eliminate racial bias, we need to really scrutinise how the GMC processes are carried out themselves. And a lot of the time, the panels in those hearings aren't very diverse. So there was a lot to me that seemed to be left out from that fair to refer review. Um, but just currently at the moment, I'm, I'm focusing on the experiences of ethnic minority doctors during the coronavirus pandemic. And I've done a piece of research um, which Melanin Medics and the British Islamic Medical Association have kindly assisted with. And it was essentially a questionnaire that I distributed to over 25 different medical associations that represent ethnic minority doctors, asking a range of questions about PPE, risk assessments, how much support doctors have had during the pandemic, uh, and whether they've been involved in decision-making processes, and of course about discrimination and bullying too. So I did an initial report on risk assessments a few weeks ago where I found that 65% of doctors said they hadn't had a risk assessment yet, which was six weeks on from that NHS England guidance in April, um, just showing how, how sadly the ethnic minority doctors are being left behind during this pandemic. And the next part of the story I'm working on will address bullying and discrimination. So not surprisingly, over half of the doctors who responded to me, and I had well over a thousand responses, reported that they'd experienced discrimination and bullying and that it had got worse during the pandemic. Many doctors left very sad accounts of their, their personal experiences. Um, and I'm currently seeking some sort of anonymous first-hand accounts of this to inform my report. So, you know, if anybody wants to get in touch, I've left my email address um, with one of the panel members. I'm also on Twitter at Amara Sophia. My DMs are open. So please do get in touch because I'd really love to hear from you. And I just hope that by shining a light on these issues, it may instigate some change. Thank you so much, Amara, and um, good luck with your research. Um, I hope we can make a difference, especially with this webinar. Um, we have a question. Dr. Madupi, would you like to answer this question? Um, it's, what can we do as medical students to work towards inequality in our medical curriculum? Number one, don't be alone. Don't be on your own. Interact with similar people with similar the same problem. And just raise the point, complain, mention it to the authority. I find that very, very helpful. Talk to someone. That was very helpful from beginning to, to now. You need to talk to somebody. You need to educate yourself as well. What are the helps out there for me? Who can I speak to? I found, number one, when it was pretty bad for me, speaking to BMA, they were able to direct me to different organization. In fact, it was one of them who suggested speaking to my um, GP. And then, like my medical student who spoke to me, she felt empowered and the others felt encouraged. What you just don't bear it on your own. There's help there look for it, seek for it, and just um, don't be aggressive and just deal with it in a nice, calm way. Education, you need to educate people. Like one of the speakers said earlier on, when you ask them, I didn't get that joke, could you repeat it, please? It makes some people think again. But whatever you do, don't, feel, don't be isolated speak out and seek for help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Madupe. It's very sad when I hear these cases. Can I just unmute um, Benedicta Harrison? Are you there, Benedicta? If you unmute yourself, are you there? You had your hand up? Benedicta, are you there? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me now? If we can hear you, and if you, this is, let this be the last question because we are running over, but um, I thought it was quite important. So, if you can, you, can, you, can you hear me, we can hear you very clearly. Would you like to repeat okay. your question? 
Okay, the question I was asking was, I mean, I've had two, two things. One was putting in an application for a job and my team lead actually called me to an office and told me, you know what, I've taken your application out of the process because I found your application very irritating to read. Put that aside. And also, whereby I was in a different trust, um, two junior girls, both of them were um, students on the ward at the time I was a ward sister, and then they confounded in their own confided in their own friend and said to the friend they will do whatever it takes to get my position even though they were newly qualified to get my position as a sister and what did they do they fabricated stories about me to the point that they were saying things that i was writing about god things on the world i was doing all you know i was bringing my own food i wasn't giving them and all these things to the point that i was rather disciplined their the, 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 the trust didn't go to the world to ask whether what they were saying was true or not, but I was the one who was disciplined to the point that I was demoted, being told that I, wasn't, I didn't deserve to be a sister. And then they got the, uh, promoted to be ward sisters and ward managers. And this is what I felt as racism at the time. That to the point so that I was off work for four, almost four years with stress that I had to be put on medication. Very sorry to hear that experience there. Another experience which has been really sad throughout this whole webinar. Um, would you like to make any comments, Mr. Razak, about that? I'm not so sure really that I can comment really, other than obviously I'm very sad to, to hear about that um, and kind of experience. Um, I think um, I know really that there are several things really that the NHS is actively doing. Again, I don't. I work currently within the local government, not the NHS. Um, but I know that um, that the NHS Confederation clearly are setting up through uh, Lord Victor Adewale a, um, a a race observatory in terms of uh, racial disparities. So clearly collecting evidence around this, and clearly Victor is is hardly uh, visible. Uh, he comes from obviously a um, a, a background really where you know he's um, risen um, clearly as chief executive of Turning Point. Um, you know he has clearly got a lot of experience in terms of leadership and in terms of um, his own experience. But then in terms of the NHS itself, really, I think the, re the NHS recognises really that there's there's a lot of work to do really, and clearly I know that the People's Directorate. Piran Asar, I know that uh, Habib Hakvi, Nakvi really, and others clearly are working on this day and night really in terms of uh, some of the work that's already been done. The work clearly is um, in terms of what's happening at the front line, clearly things, um, you know, all the reports clearly show over the last few years that things have actually deteriorated to the point really where we are at a low ebb. But I, I think all I can say really is that you know, we, we need to redouble our efforts. Um, the webinar clearly provides, um, you know, all panelists and and, um, and participants to redouble their efforts in terms of making society and the NHS a fairer, more equal and a better place to be, um, as well as addressing the immediate issue around a pandemic situation. So I always say really that I'm hopeful the last 30 years haven't been without challenge. Life is not, um, you know, without without challenge and sacrifice and dedication and passion. You know, if it was really, you know, we would, you know, we would not be the people that we are. Um, we need to continue uh, to do the work that we do, um, and I'm just hopeful, really, that we can build upon uh, these these experiences and clearly create a, a slightly different future for future generations of our workforce and also our children. And clearly, by the time I always say, by the time I leave the planet, really, by you know whatever that time actually then comes, I hope that we leave it in a better place than we actually when we actually then found it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that. And um, I know I have to hand over to the chair in a moment, but um, before I do, I'd like to just mention this one comment from Charmaine Williams, um, and it's. Um, she says, thank you for putting on the webinar. And it's lovely to hear Olamade Dada speak and wishing organization Melanin Medics 
every success. And can I say that we echo that because um, Khadija and Olamade are medical students and they've set up, they've founded this organization, Melanin Medics. So I wish you every success with that. And it's, it's an amazing achievement at such a young age. Um, so I'm um, sorry if, um, if we've missed out many, many questions. Uh, but if you email into the BEMA uh, website or to the uh, webinars at BEMA web, um, email address, then we'll try and get those um, questions answered. Um, also, Melanin Medics can be found on Instagram. And Amara um, Alahi from the BBC, um, she, we will um, contact you with her email address if you want to help her with her research. Now I'm going to hand you back to Fatima, your chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Shinaz. Um, so I'd like to thank you all our panelists for your excellent contribution and thank you all for joining us today. Webinar hosted by British Islamic Medical Association. Thank you also to our frontline workers on the 72 year anniversary of the NHS. Please allow us to go um, over some quick announcements before we end. Firstly, we would very much appreciate if you could fill, fill out our feedback form, which can be found on the um, on the box chat box and also uh, on the screen um, if, if this would help us um, in terms of future webinars what to deliver um, Bima would like to also invite you to our upcoming webinar on domestic violence entitled locked in after lockdown please do join us on Sunday 26 July at 2 p.m the link to register is on the screen and finally, don't forget that BEMA is free to join and details on how to join is on the screen or on the chat box or you can find them on social media. Um, BEMA is a non-profit organisation. We do heavily rely on donations, so please do consider making a small donation if you can. Thank you so much for, to everybody and have a good afternoon. Please keep safe and goodbye from all of us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.